See this hand fist of rebellion that Chris is doing right here? This is the secret of money in cities. This is the secret right here of prospering cities, that money makes money. This is the difference between rich people and wealthy people. Rich people have money. Wealthy people have an ecosystem that reproduces more wealth. Chris is saying this is the secret of money. And he's holding his Freemasonic fist of rebellion. Have you never read the scriptures? The builders rejected Yeshua as the cornerstone, but they often use the word cornerstone to be able to mask who they are. The Law of Margin Many years ago, I owned a consulting company called Cornerstone Consulting, which was dedicated to helping business people become more profitable, or in some cases, profitable in the first place. It was astonishing to me how many business people actually did not understand the simplest concepts about money. Here's one important lesson that I call the law of margin. Let's say you pay a dollar for a product and you sell it for two dollars. You just made one dollar or a hundred percent markup. Now let's suppose that you want to increase your sales so you give your customer a 25 percent discount on the price selling the product for a dollar fifty. Your product costs remain the same. Consequently, your profit dropped by 50% to 50 cents rather than a dollar. In effect, you dropped your price 25%, but you reduced your profit by 50%. This means you have to sell twice as many products just to break even. Lowering your prices without reducing your cost of goods is often the fastest way to go out of business. On the other hand, if you raise the original price of your product just 10%, to $2.20. You will make 20 cents more, increasing your profit from a dollar to a dollar 20, which is a 20% increase in profits. It is very important to keep an eye on how your cost of goods sold is related to the price you are charging for your product and how the price you set or the sale you run affects your profit margin. If you want to establish a sense with customers that a product or service is worth a certain price, no matter what your cost of goods are, then you can set the price and give a one-time discount to get it into the market. For instance, if your cost of... This is Chris Valentin's Poverty, Riches, and Wealth, read by Chris Valentin. Goods on a product is a dollar, and you offer your product or service at five dollars, but then you give a one-time 50% discount. You just told your customer that the value of your product is five dollars even though they are buying it for the hot deal of two dollars and fifty cents initially this worth is not based on the cost of goods but on some other criteria for example that your product saves the customer an hour a day on some task they perform you just created another rationale for buying your product or service based on what their time is worth to them wealth multiplies when the value of your product is not tied to the cost of goods but of course, this only works if you have a corner on the market. He doesn't see this. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. It, my, so even to the point that my dad told me what the Ponzi scheme was for them stealing our town back about 2002, huh. 2004 maybe, he kept asking me how my credit was because he had figured out by going into their financial meetings that they had put a thing on the, to go to school supernatural ministry, you have to bless your host of your house with $400 a month. Wow. If you're coming from out of the country, it, it's in, their, it's in their, their contract. When they come over here, they have to bless their host with $400 a month. That's crazy. That's absolutely insane. Right. Especially because that was written down in 1996 when all of this started. Our housing market our, to rent a bedroom in our town would have cost between one hundred and seventy-five and two hundred and fifty dollars a month to rent a bedroom at that time. To buy a house would have been one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So they put I, I had the whole Ponzi scheme written out of what they did, and they can take as much property as they want. 
that there's a way that I, I showed that they could pull $10,600 prior to any student coming into the country to get the down payment for the house. Oh, man. They bring three st Inside the contract, it says that they have to pay $400 a month for the nine-month session, and the entire session has to be paid in advance if they are coming from out of the country. <sighs> Which is $3,800 a piece or something. So three kids that were from out of the country, and you can finance the down payment for a house. And these houses, some of them have 16 kids inside of them. That's... And some of these people are, are just bankrolling the situation. Of course they are. And they're doing the same thing. The Law of Margin. Many years ago, I owned a consulting company called Cornerstone Consulting, which was dedicated to helping business people become more profitable, or in some cases, profitable in the first place. It was astonishing to me how many business people actually did not understand the simplest concepts about money. Here's one important lesson that I call the law of margin. Let's say you pay a dollar for a product and you sell it for $2. You just made $1 or 100% markup. Now let's suppose that you want to increase your sales so you give your customer a 25% discount on the price selling the product for $1.50. Your product costs remain the same. Consequently, your profit dropped by 50% to 50 cents rather than a dollar. In effect, you dropped your price 25%, but you reduced your profit by 50%. This means you have to sell twice as many products just to break even. Lowering your prices without reducing your cost of goods is often the fastest way to go out of business. On the other hand, if you raise the original price of your product just 10%, to $2.20. You will make 20 cents more, increasing your profit from a dollar to a dollar 20, which is a 20% increase in profits. It is very important to keep an eye on how your cost of goods sold is related to the price you are charging for your product and how the price you set or the sale you run affects your profit margin. If you want to establish a sense with customers that a product or service is worth a certain price, no matter what your cost of goods are, then you can set the price and give a one-time discount to get it into the market. For instance, if your cost of... This is Chris Valentin's Poverty, Riches, and Wealth, read by Chris Valentin. ...goods on a product is a dollar, and you offer your product or service at five dollars, but then you give a one-time 50% discount. You just told your customer that the value of your product is five dollars even though they are buying it for the hot deal of two dollars and fifty cents initially this worth is not based on the cost of goods but on some other criteria for example that your product saves the customer an hour a day on some task they perform you just created another rationale for buying your product or service based on what their time is worth to them wealth multiplies when the value of your product is not tied to the cost of goods but of course, this only works if you have a corner on the market. As an okay, it's of goods. But of course, this only works if you have a corner on the market. As an okay, tied to the cost of goods. But of course, this only works if you have a corner on the market.
federal criminal defense, and I'd like to talk to you for a few moments about something that a lot of people... Hi, my name is Glenn Obedin. I'm a criminal defense attorney, and I specialize in federal criminal defense, and I'd like to talk to you for a few moments about something that a lot of people have heard of but may not understand exactly what it is, and that's the federal RICO statute. Uh, the RICO statute is a, a very effective tool that federal prosecutors use in any cases involving quote-unquote organized crime. And that doesn't simply mean what many people think of traditionally as organized crime, um, meaning the mafia. Uh, the RICO statute is, is very effective in prosecuting gang-related crimes as well. And that's a big topic out here on Long Island. There are a lot of gangs and there's a lot of gang activity. And federal prosecutors have been prosecuting gang members under the RICO statute. If you are connected or have a loved one who is connected to one of the gangs out here on Long Island, you could quite easily find yourself entangled in a federal RICO indictment. Uh, the way that a RICO indictment is proven is the government shows that a member of a gang commits a crime to enhance or further position within the gang. And that simply is enough to prove a RICO statute. So if you are or have a loved one who's associated with a gang, any gang activity that's committed the government will try and prove that that improves the standing of the defendant within the gang itself, promotes his position within the gang. It doesn't have to be money, and oftentimes it's not monetary. It's simply promoting your position within the gang, and that is enough to entangle you in a RICO statute that could uh, include everything from a conspiracy to commit a robbery to a conspiracy to commit a murder, even if you're not the one who actually committed the crime. So if you have a loved one or you yourself are a member of a gang and uh, you're aware that some other people around you have been arrested and charged in a federal prosecution, it might behoove you to speak with a federal attorney and understand and be able to protect yourself against the possibility of being charged in a RICO indictment. If you have any further questions
But exactly is the Racketeer Influenced and Corruption Organization Act or RICO law that uh, is that Willis is using against Trump? Well, specifically allows prosecutors to target people in positions of authority within a criminal organization, not just lower level people doing the dirty work. Yeah, generally speaking, it allows prosecutors to charge multiple people who commit separate crimes while they're all working towards a common goal. This is instead of making sure you can pin any one specific specific crime on any one person. You're essentially charging a whole group of people for a whole group of crimes. And they consider that to be a criminal enterprise. So you're going to hear that word a lot, enterprise. Now, Georgia's RICO Act makes it a crime to participate in one of those enterprises through what they're calling a pattern of racketeering activity. Or it's a crime to just even conspire to do that. Now, it's important to note here that uh, the crimes that are being alleged don't necessarily have to come to fruition or work for a RICO charge to still stick. Some of his alleged co-conspirators are under the RICO Act. The acts of one are deemed to be the acts of all. And you can really compare and contrast that with special counsel Jack Smith, who had unindicted co-conspirators but named Trump as the only person uh, being charged in that case. This case, very, very different. Experts say Willis is using the RICO law to allow prosecutors to provide a more complete picture of everything that went on and have a more cohesive narrative that ties everyone together and can allow them to sort of tell that story, which then allows them to get in some detailed information that might not relate to specific crimes, but would still be relevant to the broader alleged scheme here. Hi guys, it's Julian Hemmings here. I want to do a quick... But on some other criteria, for example, that your product saves the customer an hour a day on some task they perform. You just created another rationale for buying your product or service based on what their time is worth to them. Wealth multiplies when the value of your product is not tied to the cost of goods. But of course, this only works if you have a corner on the market. As an... Okay. This only counts if you have a corner on the market. We're going to see if there's anything else in here real quick, and then I'm going to take you back to this only counts if you have a corner on the market. Example of working with the law of margin. When I came to Bethel Church, we were in financial trouble. We could not even meet our weekly payrolls. I started digging around to understand why a church with a thousand people in attendance could be so broke. With the law of margin. When I came to Bethel Church, we were in financial trouble. We could not even meet our weekly payrolls. I started digging around to understand why a church with a thousand people in attendance could be so broke. At the time, Bethel. Whoa. We could not even meet our weekly payrolls. I started digging around to understand why a church with a thousand people in attendance could be so broke. At the time. Do this one again. Need to do this again. Goat Lord Farms. 11140 Sarah Drive. What is a Goat Lord? Well, there is the game called Goat Lords. That's a celebrity edition. Let's look again. We're starting to get there. Let's, let's use Wikipedia, even though I know not everybody thinks that they're fantastic, but Goat Lord. And they have it as one word may be referred to Baphomet, a satanic deity. There's also a band called Goat Lord out of Las Vegas and other stuff, but Goat Lord may refer to Baphomet, satanic deity. Baphomet, the Goat Lord. Baphomet is a deity allegedly worshipped by Knights Templar that subsequently became incorporated into various occult and Western esoteric traditions. The name Baphomet appears in trial transcripts for the Inquisition of the Knights Templar starting in 1307.
I'm not your father. And you pull up the name on any of the pictures. <laughs> Baphomet is a deity allegedly worshipped by Knights Templar that subsequently became incorporated into various occult and Western esoteric traditions. The name Baphomet appears in trial transcripts for the Inquisition of the Knights Templar starting in 1307. If you look at it. So I explained in this video, Sean Foyt, Let Us Worship, birthed a movement in the womb of the Whore of Babylon. That's, that sundial bridge was built by Templar Santiago Calatrava, his architecture logo is a Knights Templar um, cross. Both sides of his family in Spain are both Templars. They both have their own orders, the Santiago's and the Calatravas. So this guy is a hybrid of hybrids who gets paid millions and millions and millions of dollars to go around the world and build penises and vaginas. Go and look at... Um, Israel Polytechnic, Jerusalem Polytechnic. One second, let me go check that out. But so Sundial Bridge is Baphomet worship. Penis, vagina, ejaculation, and the seed are all symbolized inside the architecture of that of that thing. And that's where Sean Foyt started. Sorry, propane truck just drove by. That's where Sean Foyt started his um, crusade for being the super spreader. Those two hands to the sky. First sign or do guard. Sean's a Templar. Sean's a Templar, you guys. These people worship Lucifer as God and they are stealing right in California using the Templar's seven mountain mandate. button okay so this is the important part oh hold on this is the important part of messed up church from yes uh, three days ago how much money do the Johnsons and Valentin really make so this I don't care about all of the money that they're making I'm gonna show you something else this is this should be far more important than how much money they're making and, uh... 
large lots, and you would be able to visit this address, 11140 Sarah. Looks like the Johnson family farm had another real good harvest. <laughs> Family farm made three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. The the. So here's what I could find online about this Johnson Family Farm Incorporated. You can see the address one 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 four zero Sarah Drive, in California, and you can also see that the agent and the chief executive officer is somebody named Brian Mark Johnson. And yes, it's Brian Johnson, Bill Johnson's son, the guy from Bethel Music. So if you were in Reading and you went to Bethel Church, it wouldn't be hard at all to just take a short drive to this nice little wooded area with uh, nice homes on uh, large lots. And you would be able to visit this address, 11140 Sarah Drive. And you wouldn't see a farm. What you'd see is a residence, a house. But there is something there called... Goat Lord Farm. It's a place of worship. It's listed as a place of worship with this address. And you wouldn't see a farm. What you'd see is a residence, a house. But there is something there called Goat Lord Farm. It's a place of worship. It's listed as and you wouldn't see a farm, what you'd see is a residence, a house. But there is something there called Goat Lord Farm. It's a place of worship. It's listed as a place of worship with this address. This is the guy, Brian Johnson, who's getting paid a ton of money to work at Bethel. And yet, he's got his own church in his house, apparently. I don't think it's a real church. In fact, I'm sure it's not a real church. I just don't know what it is. Luke Hendrickson says... The best goat lord you'll ever meet. Hmm. Example of working with the law of margin. When I came to Bethel Church, we were in financial trouble. We could not even meet our weekly payrolls. I started digging around to understand why a church with a thousand people in attendance could be so broke. And with the law of margin. When I came to Bethel Church, we were in financial trouble. We could not even meet our weekly payrolls. I started digging around to understand why a church with a thousand people in attendance could be so broke. At the time, uh, can be prosecuted under the RICO Act. Um, in order to be prosecuted under the RICO Act, the prosecutors have to, uh, there's different levels uh, and different, thing, different elements that the government has to prove um, when it comes to prosecutions of RICO. However, generally the prosecutor has to prove at least two or three separate acts that the corporation is committing that are illegal. So for example, when you are prosecuting a gang, a street gang with RICO, prosecutors usually would uh, show that that gang is dealing with drugs and committing murders. Uh, that would be enough to prove a RICO. Uh, depends on, again, how, uh, what statute uh, section under the RICO Act being processed. Sometimes the process. Yeah, and um, so I had traveled to his, he has a thing called School of Prophetic Trainers. Yeah. Because I was like, I think I want to try to go out in the world and solve problems through the revelatory realm. But I didn't really know what I was doing. So, check this out. He has this whole thing set up where throughout the whole conference there's these different um mountains where it's like the mountain of government the mountain of hollywood yeah, the mountain the spheres, of media kind yeah of spheres, and, and there was sort of these like they didn't call them sq tests but that's kind of what was happening yeah. it's like get a word of knowledge here see if you can solve this crime see if you get words of knowledge Finding at children. the family mountain like what's your metron right yeah. did you just hear that when she says um solving crimes chris doesn't say anything else Except for, he says, finding children. So I call them SQ tests, but that's kind of what was happening. Yeah. It was like, get a word of knowledge here, see if you can solve this crime, see if you get words of knowledge. Finding at children. the family mountain, like... Finding children. Listen. What's your... 
call them SQ tests, but that's kind of what was happening. Yeah. It was like, get a word of knowledge here, see if you can solve this crime, see if you get words of knowledge. Finding at children. the family mountain, like. Finding children. That's nuts that he, the, the pedophile is saying, we're taking your children, we're hiding your children, and then we're going to tell you where your children are at. I already know how this works. They have all the symbolism saying that they have a pedophile sex cult that Kimberly Johnson, Bill Johnson's ex-sister-in-law, runs three different sex cults using pedophile logos as their logos. They go to the courts. They take the kids away from the loving parents. They give them to their pedophile friends inside Bethel that are all that have their. Um, oh, sorry, I'm a little worked up. If you walk out the back door of Children's Legacy Center on the next corner behind them, they have foster care systems that have a sign outside that say, now hiring type stuff. All they want is anybody who's never been convicted of a crime that would qualify to be able to have children these people get paid for taking children from one person and giving them to another person that's their entire livelihood kimberly johnson's entire li livelihood is stealing children through the court system completely legal it doesn't matter if they lie to the court systems because that's how they stole my child they lied to the courts to be able to take my son away from me. You guys wonder why I do this? One of the things of why I do this, well, besides the fact scripture tells us to do this, is because Bethel leadership said Brian has a religious spirit inside of him, and because he has a religious spirit, that means that we we should take Brian's son away from him and not allow Brian to see his kid. The prophets prophesy lies in Yeshua's name. He didn't speak to them. He didn't send them. He didn't say have a psychic experience and charge $2,000. What does scripture say about the prophets now that we know that these guys are just psychics? And interesting, huh? He uses the Bible in his war with Diddy. So, uh, Diddy's pedophile sex trafficking group is directly connected to Bethel and their pedophile pastors association. I love you guys. Seriously, you have to stop allowing the world to tell you they're Christians if they aren't going to do the things that are inside the scriptures. Have a great night. I'm going to cut this off. I'm going to start that new uh, playlist that I mentioned at the beginning of this. I changed my mind. Let's go through this list real quick. So first we have this guy who's saying that he wants to be able to have a revival of Count Zinzendorf's um, cult. That's who Bethel calls for sex cult revival. And Mike Bickle is a member of that cult. These are the proofs of that, showing who the cult is. Then we see... I Hawk KC, their sex cult from 11 years ago, the cult victims end up saying inside videos that they were treated in this way and treat, the women had to have sex in front of all of the men kind of stuff. Inside Count Zinzendorf's group, that was going on. Inside I Hawk KC, that was going on. Right here where it says, I am an NAR sexual assault victim. That story directly connects to Puff Daddy and directly connects to um, Bethel. 
through the stuff that I just was telling you. Montreal Darrett is inside this I am an NAR sex, uh, sexual assault victim. His buddy, Darwin Hobbs, that was on Oprah Winfrey, he's the one that was telling me that he was going to take me home with him and do not good things to me. And then I've already exposed that part with Trail and Oprah and that um, Darwin is wearing his Templar ring. So that connects together that part. This is more stuff from the New Apostolic Reformation, different times that different people in the group have been accused of sex trafficking. Um, Todd Bentley was already convicted of touching a minor boy. Todd White says sex traffickers are not our enemies while he is wearing a shirt designed with a Baphomet male-female logo on the shirt. This video is called Bethel Church, Bethel Music, Bethel Reading, Bethel Kidnappings. Bethel Church faked a kidnapping of Sherry Pepini. Nickelodeon's pedophile went and exposed Bethel Church's pedophiles. Bethel's Assemblies of God talks about an undetectable mind control slave. Here is proof that Bethel Church at Brian Johnson's house has a 501c3 nonprofit church at his house called Goat Lord Farms, and Goat Lord is the Baphomet. Are there more proofs of Bethel related pedophile rings in Reading? The answer is yes. The I went to a Bethelites yard sale. This part, there's a lady in there that started crying when she came to my yard sale, telling me that Bethel kids, I don't know which age, I don't know if they were Bethel church, minor minors, or if they were Bethel BSSM young adults, but that a large number of Bethel students were being touched. Inside Chris Valentin's uh, video about Chris Valentin as a schizophrenic, he tells said Roth that he used to have visions of him touching and molesting his children. If you watch the entire video, it will prove that Chris Valentin is a DSM-5 verifiable schizophrenic, which means that when he was making stories of, I was touching and molesting my kids, and now you go back and you look at Jason Valentin's face, when he talks about those types of things, you can see the way that he like pulls himself inside of himself almost. Child abuse in the charismatic church cults that was done at Rodney Howard Brown's church. So this is completely, you guys have to think about Hillsong, Brian Houston's dad's already been busted. Brian Houston got busted. Carl Lentz has been busted. Um, and Carl's directly connected to Justin Bieber. And Justin Bieber said that, hold on. So these are all.
about a massive drug bust in Shasta County this afternoon. One of the suspects, a longtime Redding police officer. Action News Now reporter Anna Torreya is live in Redding. Anna, what did investigators find? Well, the CHP seized over 100 pounds of processed marijuana, more than 300 marijuana plants, 30 grams of cocaine, close to $60,000, and even two guns. Now, several people who work in that area tell me that this is the building that police raided. Police say the warehouse is located off Old 44 and Crossroads Drive. One person I spoke to tells me they noticed activity happening there for several weeks. Um, there's people going in and out like they were renting the place and maybe getting it ready or something and the door always stayed open there's like maybe two vehicles and then last I seen activity was last Thursday Police arresting 40-year-old Heather Legault, 39-year-old Michael Gray, and 53-year-old Will Williams, who is a corporal with the Reading Police Department. They are all facing numerous drug-related crimes. And at the press conference today, Reading Police Chief Bill Schuler said that right now, Corporal Williams is on paid administrative leave. Reporting live... The police unit has shut down a suspected drug house. Concerned neighbors tipped police off to the home in the... 3700 block of Riverview Drive. Area homeowners reported increased vehicle, bicycle, and foot traffic at the house at all hours of the day and night and an increase in crime. Police started surveillance of the home and spotted and arrested 30 year old Kimberly Wilcox. Wilcox had been arrested eight times in Shasta County and was on the supervised own recognizance program for various drug charges. Officers were then allowed to search her home and found more drugs and six others were arrested. The house did not have electricity or water and Redding Code Enforcement shut it down. Right there you go. You guys awesome. know an officer, Will Williams? Uh, no. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just curious. No. He was the one uh, Reading policeman uh, arrested for cocaine, marijuana, illeg oh, yeah. illegal guns. Yeah, I heard of him. So it's kind of natural, or would be natural, to be a little concerned about Reading policemen yeah. in general.
church, we were in financial trouble. We could not even meet our weekly payrolls. I started digging around to understand why a church with a thousand people in attendance could of working with the law of margin. When I came to Bethel Church, we were in financial trouble. We could not even meet our weekly payrolls. I started digging around to understand why a church with a thousand people in attendance could be so broke. At the time... <laughs> I'm Seth Dahl, and I'm so excited to be joining you in the next season. I'd run into somebody who had a bunch of coke, and he said, well, we can't find any marijuana, but we can get, we can get some coke, and we got some. He's joining you in the next God is insane. Listen, Josh, I want you to meditate. Go over the corner, and you're like, oh. Um. and I'm so excited to be joining you in the next season. I'd run into somebody who had a bunch of coke, and he said, well, we can't find any marijuana, but we can get, we can get some coke, and we got some. He's Hi guys, it's Julian Hemmings here. I want to do a quick, well, not really a quick video, but a video about what is a RICO. And I want to talk about the historical significance of it and its current day usage. Um, you know, so please sit back, get some popcorn, uh, get some a notepad, or just kind of get, you know, uh, look at this. This is not legal advice, of course, uh, I'm a law student. I'm just a guy who likes sharing out information and uh, talking about the effects of the law. Uh, and so, thank you guys for watching. Thank you for going. It, it means the world. Um, and if no one ever watches this video, at least I know that I made it and it's something that people can uh, refer to uh, in their journey of, of trying to protect themselves. So, the question, right, is what is a RICO? So the RICO stands for uh, the Federal Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organization Law. And it was passed in 1970 as the ultimate hitman in mob op prosecutions. Uh, prior to the RICO, the government could only try mob-related crimes individually instead of shutting down an entire criminal organization. RICO allows for prosecution of all individuals involved in a corrupt organization. In an article written by John L. Smith, mob families began to crack under the pressure due to even the strongest stand-up guy having trouble facing the 20 year and more sentences. While the RICO was originally aimed at the mafia, over the past 37 years, prosecutors have used it to face many forms of organized crime. There is a civil and criminal component to RICO. To violate a RICO, this is from Justia, to violate a RICO, the person must engage in a pattern of, acti of racketeering activity connected to an enterprise. This could be gambling, murder, kidnap, arson, drug dealing, bribery. To charge under RICO, at least two predicate crimes have, must have occurred within the 10 years, and it must have been committed through the enterprise. An enterprise could be a crime family, a street gang, a drug cartel, a political party, a corporation, a managed care company, and an enter enterprise is, is defined as a discrete entity, but it is not an individual. The criminal RICO statute for prison terms of 20 years and severe financial penalties. The law allows prosecutors to attack assets so they can't be whisked out of the country before a judgment. To succeed on a claim of RICO, there must be criminal activity, and that criminal activity must be enumerated, which is written in code. 
pattern of criminal activity. And so again, you need at least two crimes and it must be within the statute of limitations. So RICO has a four year statute of limitations, which begin when the victim discovers the damages. The RICO elements and prohibited activities are included under 18 USC 1962. So you guys can check that out. What's going on and, and all that with your attorney. The elements of the RICO again are that the defendant must be directly or indirectly employed by or associated with an enterprise. The defendant must have engaged in a pattern of racketeering and the crime committed by the defendant must have affected interstate or foreign commerce. The burden of proof on the defendant when their items are being seized during the investigation was that the items that were obtained were not obtained through legal activity. The RICO Act was passed by, Nick's, by the Nixon administration to get the leaders of the mafia because they were originally unable to do so because their foot soldiers committed the crime. The RICO allowed prosecutors to convince mafia members to testify against their leaders. As we were talking about before, guys, there was an immense um, issue of mafia activity within this country. And the foot soldiers were being sent to do all the crimes. So the RICO is a tool to flip people, right? To flip the lower members, to get up to the food chain, to the top guys. Right now you're seeing it happening with the YSL trial with Young Thug in Atlanta. You're seeing it happen all across the country. Um, prosecutor offices are kind of getting wind to this being a real tool to reveal gang activity. Now, is the RICO a bad thing? Is RICO a good thing? Well, you know, in law, it's really hard to cement things as simple, uh, bad, or good. They're very complicated things with complicated issues at hand, with complicated motivations. Now, the mafia was a major criminal enterprise that took over this country and led to countless deaths all across uh, all across America. You know, our law enforcement, what they want to do is keep us safe, right? And and that's and that's a noble uh, motivation. The question comes in when there is too much expansion of RICO, where you're getting people who are so indirectly connected that they're just being landed. Uh, people are getting scared. Uh, people are even fearing that, you know, the First Amendment rights can be striked as a result, right? Because, you know, what, uh, one guy who's doing a lot of um, legal talks right now, Bruce Willis, is talking about how, you know, uh, your lyrics can be used in a criminal trial if they can show that, that they're backed up by something, right? Backed up by a given act. Uh, you know, again, guys, I'm not an attorney here, but this is a big, big, big tool that prosecutor offices are using to eliminate gangs off the streets, right? You're, you know, you're, you're getting charged with at least 20 years, okay? So watch what you say, watch who you connect to, because you don't want to lose your freedom. All right, guys, thank you so much and have a great one. Consulting company called Cornerstone Consulting, which was dedicated to helping business people become more profitable, or in some cases, profitable in the first place. It was astonishing to me how many business people actually did not understand the simplest concepts about money. Here's one important lesson that I call the law of margin. Let's say you pay a dollar for a product and you sell it for two dollars. You just made one dollar or 100% markup. Now let's suppose that you want to increase your sales, so you give your customer a 25% discount on the price, selling the product for $1.50. Your product costs remain the same. Consequently, your profit dropped by 50% to 50 cents rather than a dollar. In effect, you dropped your price 25%, but you reduced your profit by 50%. This means you have to sell twice as many products just to break even. Lowering your prices without reducing your cost of goods is often the fastest way to go out of business. On the other hand, if you raise the original price of your product just 10% to $2.20, you will make 20 cents more, increasing your profit from $1 to $1.20, which is a 20% increase in profits. 
It is very important to keep an eye on how your cost of goods sold is related to the price you are charging for your product and how the price you set or the sale you run affects your profit margin. If you want to establish a sense with customers that a product or service is worth a certain price, no matter what your cost of goods are, then you can set the price and give a one-time discount to get it into the market. For instance, if your cost of This is Chris Valentin's Poverty, Riches, and Wealth, read by Chris Valentin. Goods on a product is a dollar, and you offer your product or service at five dollars, but then you give a one-time 50% discount. This only counts if you have a corner on the market. We're going to see if there's anything else in here real quick, and then I'm going to take you back to this only counts if you have a corner on the market. Example of working with the law of margin. When I came to Bethel Church, we were in financial trouble. We could not even meet our weekly payrolls. I started digging around to understand why a church with a thousand people in attendance could be so broke. At the time, Bethel... Whoa. I have never heard that Bethel was broke at the beginning when Chris got there and they couldn't even pay their payrolls. That's a whole other reason why they would want to start this financial Ponzi scheme that we're about to look at. Church hosted about four conferences a year. One of the things I discovered was that all these conferences lost huge amounts of money. I started inquiring why the people who came to the conferences and benefited from the experience would not pay enough admission to even cover the cost of the event. Well, one of the staff members said, when we raised the admission price to cover our costs, some people complained. I was surprised by the answer. Don't drop the price, I argued. Improve their experience. And remember, if you gave the conference away for free, some people would still complain. The next conference we did, we raised our price to cover our costs and did our best to improve the conference attendees' experience. The truth is, in the past, we had reacted to all the complaints by just lowering the price, so we never put any tools in place to measure the experience of our attendees. This time, we immediately enacted a conference survey to get feedback about their experience. The results were amazing. Our conferences improved dramatically. They were filled to capacity, and of course, a few people still complain. Pricing is an art that needs to be taken seriously. The average business in America lasts fewer than two years. Much of this attrition can be attributed to a lack of understanding of the power of wealth. Many entrepreneurs... Okay, so before we start this part, if you were out on tour and went with Big Daddy Weave out on tour, you would meet a pastor named Gene. Gene is the former financial pastor over Little Country Church in Redding, California. So he was in charge of all the finances at Little Country. And after I presented this set of information to him, I had already presented this information to Julie Winter. Remember, that's Bethel's mayor and Chris Valentin's legalized drug dealer. I presented this information to her. My dad was at the meeting that this information came from. And Gene said, this is so blatantly obvious that if anybody says that this is not the financial Ponzi scheme, one of the financial Ponzi schemes that Bethel is running, that they are blind. So the head of finances from Little Country Church, who's the on-tour pastor for Big Daddy Weave, says that if people can't understand that this is the one of the financial Ponzi schemes that Bethel is using to steal Redding, that they are blind. <laughs> Been explained to me for years how using a financial calculator, how Bethel is manipulating our housing market and stealing Redding, my source, who sits in Bethel financial meetings, explained to me that on applications for Bethel's BSSM, the students were required to bless their hosts with $400 a month, price setting, when the average bedroom in Redding at the time was renting for $175 to $250. Use the price of the houses in 1996 when this started. The BSSM invasion, orchestrated by Chris Valentin. The cost to buy a house in Reading in 1996 was approximately $120,000. So a mortgage plus fees rounded up to about $800 a month. The $400 each student times three bedrooms would, equate, would be $1,200. The rent of an owner would make off of just three students, but giving these scheme participants an instant $400 a month plus a free house at the end of their mortgage. The owner would also be able to take out loans against the equity. 
Many houses in our area have eight or more students. I've been to houses now that have 12 students. So 12 times 400 a month times nine months. The way they scam the down payments of the money for a house. The students from BSSM that came from out of the country were still required to bless their host with $400 a month, but they had to pay all nine months in advance. $400 a month times nine months is $3,600 per student times three foreign students equals $10,800 all in advance of coming to the school. This could have been used easily as a down payment back in 1996. $3,600 times eight students would be $28,000. Are you starting to see the Ponzi scheme yet? Twenty three hundred Bethel students per year would take a very short time to finance the fraudulent theft of Redding, California. And Chris Valentin just explained to you that he wanted the corner on the market. Real estate manipulation, intent to defraud, intent to defraud, proven by the NAR Seven Mountain Dominion mandate. They have the intent of defrauding. They said that God gave them our town. This, Julie Winter, is Chris Valentin's legalized drug dealer, and if you look at her W, it is the same as Tesla's 369, but its design's different on purpose, but it's still the same occult meaning. That's the 369 of Tesla. So according to this, Redding's population is 9,000, I mean 91,580. Oh, that was back in... 2019. So we have 10,000 people in town that are Bethelites. We have 720 people who were um, employed by Bethel specifically. They have 9,000 people in this private group that they only rent houses out to each other. They take all of our houses off of the market. Notice how even this BSSM um, housing still uses the Chevron as their logo. They're hiding who they are. And 2,400 members in this group are house, are, have taken away our housing, have used Bethel money to buy up our housing, and then they tell us that they're doing great and amazing things for our town while they're stealing our town. So that first group had 9,000 in it. The second group, that first group has 9,000 in it. We only just showed that there were 91,000 people in town. So this private group of 9,000 people plus the other private group of 2,300 private people have taken our housing market and said, we're in control of your housing in your town and you're going to now have to pay the market value that equates to what Chris and Bill and Bethel equated in their heads. But when everybody says there's no financial gain, why would they end up doing this financial Ponzi scheme? Your product saves the customer an hour a day on some tasks they perform. You just created another rationale for buying your product or service based on what their time is worth to them. Wealth multiplies when the value of your product is not tied to the cost of goods, but of course this only works if you have a corner on the market. Rule 5. Racketeering. The Federal RICO Act. Racketeering is a difficult to define word that's often used in the context of organized crime. Loosely, it means engaging in a pattern of illegal activity in furtherance of an organization or enterprise. Racketeering is sometimes hard to pinpoint because it's comprised of activity that would otherwise be illegal in any case, sometimes rendering the racketeering label redundant or unnecessary. Still, racketeering statutes have become major parts of federal and state arsenals in fighting crime, and organized crime in particular. 
The centerpiece of that arsenal is the federal RICO statute. The Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act was originally passed by Congress in 1970 as a means for fighting organized crime in the United States. The part of the RICO statute that defines criminal activity is divided into four major parts. The first part makes it a violation to use money gained through racketeering activity to acquire an interest in any enterprise involved in interstate commerce. The second clause makes it a violation to acquire or maintain through such racketeering activity an interest in any enterprise involved in interstate commerce. The third section forbids any person that is employed or associated with any enterprise to conduct or participate in any pattern of racketeering activity if the enterprise is engaged in business that affects interstate commerce. And the fourth clause makes it a violation to conspire to violate any of the preceding sections. In defining racketeering activity for purposes of RICO, the statute lists as statutorily defined predicate acts necessary for the establishment of a RICO violation many federal crimes, including bribery, counterfeiting, and mail-in wire fraud, as well as a number of traditionally state crimes, such as murder, arson, and robbery. The statute then goes on to provide severe criminal and civil penalties for RICO violators. Statutory criminal penalties include up to 20 years in prison for each RICO violation, plus forfeiture of all property or interest in property acquired because of a RICO violation. Civil remedies call for treble, or triple, damages to be awarded to any plaintiff damaged by a RICO violation. The federal sentencing guidelines apply a minimum offense level for RICO violations of 19, with the greater of 19 and the offense level of the underlying crimes applied. Although RICO was designed to be an aid to federal prosecutors in the fight against organized crime, the statute itself has had a much broader range of applications. RICO has strengthened the power of federal prosecutors, allowing federal prosecutions in areas that were traditionally reserved for the states in the exercise of their general police power. The Supreme Court, rather than describing RICO as a congressionally created way to combat organized crime, has noted that RICO was an aggressive initiative to supplement old remedies and develop new methods for fighting crime in general. The court has even decided that the plaintiffs or victims of RICO violations need not suffer an injury that is in any way a racketeering injury. The injury need only be a natural result of the predicate act, and need not have anything to do with the organizational racketeering activities of the defendant. The Enterprise Requirement One of the fundamental elements of RICO is that the defendant must be part of a criminal organization. While we may think of the mafia or other criminal rings when we think of criminal organization, the organizational requirement under RICO has been interpreted much more broadly. One federal grand juror serving on a Southern District of New York grand jury observed that prosecutors just seem to tack on a RICO charge to any indictment which alleges two crimes, no matter what those crimes are. A group of New Jersey plaintiffs even filed a RICO suit against an Atlantic City casino for allegedly shuffling decks of cards too frequently during blackjack games. The broad interpretation of the organizational requirement stems from the seminal Supreme Court case of United States v. Turquette. There, the Supreme Court found RICO applicable when the organization in question, a drug dealing ring, was subjected to RICO prosecution despite having no cohesion as a unit other than that they combined to engage in drug smuggling. The court held that any union or group of individuals associated in fact, although not a legal entity, could be considered an organization for purposes of RICO. In Boyle v. United States, the defendant was charged with RICO violations for participating in a string of bank robberies and other similar crimes with various other people. Although there was no structure or hierarchy in the organization, and although there were no leaders, regular meetings, or other characteristics normally associated with organizations, the court found that RICO applied. No structure is required, except that the group engaged in a pattern of illegal activity. The organizational requirement merely means that there must be a relationship between the members, a common purpose, and that they stick together long enough to engage in the illegal conduct. Moreover, the organization need not be formed or exist for economic purposes. In National Organization for Women versus Scheidler, the National Organization of Women sued an anti-abortion group under RICO for engaging in a pattern of threatening and intimidating healthcare providers. Although they had no profit motive, a unanimous Supreme Court held that RICO did not require proof that either the racketeering enterprise or the predicate acts of racketeering were motivated by an economic purpose. And therefore, if the protesters had conspired to shut down the clinics through a pattern of racketeering activity, then the clinics could maintain a RICO action. RICO can also apply to organizations that are formed for legitimate purposes and generally operate legitimately, if they engage in patterns of illegal behavior. The accounting firm Ernst & Young was sued for RICO violations for allegedly producing misleading financial audit statements on behalf of a client, though the case was later dismissed on other grounds. Enron and its accounting firm Arthur Anderson were also charged with racketeering. Similarly, in Bennett v. Berg, a not-for-profit corporation that ran a retirement community was considered an enterprise when plaintiffs alleged that representatives of the community fraudulently promoted the retirement community with materially false statements as to the village's financial soundness and the promise of affordable life care. The residential community could be considered an association in fact for purposes of RICO. Pattern and Predicate Acts RICO requires that the defendants commit a pattern of illegal activities which are also known as predicate offenses under a RICO charge. A pattern is defined very broadly and is satisfied with any two predicate acts committed within 10 years of each other. Still, the predicate acts must further the purpose of the enterprise. Unlike in a conspiracy charge where the overt act can be anything, even an otherwise legal activity that furthers the conspiracy, each RICO predicate act must be its own crime. So, for example, if an alleged racketeering enterprise is shown to have planned a bank robbery, and one of the participants is shown to have obtained the blueprints for the bank architecture, purchased a steak knife to use as a weapon, rented a getaway car, and participated in the bank robbery, no RICO charge would be justified on these allegations alone. Though the first three would all be overt acts towards a conspiracy charge, none were, in themselves, criminal acts. So the entire bank robbery would constitute only a single predicate act. Similarly, the predicate acts must be separate crimes. 
The Fifth Circuit ruled that possession with intent to distribute and actual distribution of the same marijuana were one criminal act towards the two that were necessary to show a pattern of racketeering activity. Unlike conspiracy, though, the predicate acts don't necessarily have to be in furtherance of a cohesive set of criminal schemes or plans. In Salinas v. United States, the Supreme Court allowed a RICO conviction when the defendant, a public official, accepted a series of bribes in violation of federal bribery statutes. The defendant argued that because the jury was not instructed that he must have committed or agreed to commit two predicate acts himself, he could not be considered to have acted on behalf of the enterprise. Calling the defendant's interpretation wrong, the court observed that there is no requirement of some overt act or specific act in the RICO statute before us, unlike the conspiracy provision applicable to general federal conspiracy crimes, which requires that at least one of the conspirators have committed an act to the effect of the object of the conspiracy. The predicate act's relationship to the organization can also be a flashpoint in a RICO analysis. The statute requires the racketeering activity to acquire an interest in or participate in the establishment or operation of the criminal enterprise for RICO to apply. This implies at least some distinction between the operation of the enterprise and the conduct of the defendant. For example, if the defendant himself carries out a string of terrorist activities using a pseudonym, say for example the Unabomber, it would be a stretch to then call his operations a criminal enterprise and to indict him for racketeering. RICO requires proof of a fact other than the facts required to prove the predicate acts of racketeering. The Supreme Court observed that the enterprise must be more than simply the defendant operating under a different name. Still, that the defendant incorporated and conducted his alleged racketeering activities under his corporation's name was considered a sufficiently separate enterprise for RICO to apply. RICO is thus held to apply even when a corporate employee unlawfully conducts the affairs of the corporation of which he is the sole owner. Civil RICO and Forfeiture Though RICO was designed primarily to fight crime, Section 1964 of the Federal Criminal Code provides civil remedies for RICO violations in addition to the criminal ones laid out in Section 1963. Section 1964 includes the following provisions. 1. Federal courts are given jurisdiction to remedy racketeering violations through injunctions, restrictions, and even dissolving criminal organizations. 2. The Attorney General is given authority to bring civil RICO actions and to take actions to remedy RICO violations. And 3. People injured by RICO violations are entitled to treble damages, meaning the ability to cover three times the loss sustained, including attorney's fees. Proving a RICO civil violation requires the same elements as proving a criminal RICO violation. In fact, the subject matters of many of the cases that we've discussed in this module have been civil RICO cases. However, one additional very important RICO remedy that is often applied in civil RICO cases is civil forfeiture. While Section 1964 doesn't contain the word forfeiture, the injunction power, allowed under 1964, allows the government to confiscate property used for racketeering. For example, when a defendant was convicted of racketeering for making illegal, usurious loans to car lessees who had fallen behind on their payments, the cars themselves were forfeited under RICO, even though the illegal loan was between the dealership and the customers and the cars themselves were not the subject of illegal transactions. The FBI calls asset forfeiture a powerful tool used by law enforcement agencies against criminals and criminal organizations to deprive them of their ill-gotten gains through seizure of these assets. In United States v. Simmons, the defendants, Fisher and Simmons, were convicted of some counts of racketeering involving a pattern of bribery charges. The court allowed forfeiture of more than $350,000 from Simmons, not all of which were the subject of his bribery convictions. The court held that even if the defendant was not convicted personally on all counts, the government could confiscate the gross proceeds of all illegal activities. In essence, defendants are jointly and severally liable under RICO. If there are proceeds from any of their illegal activities in the hands of any of the other defendants, those are still subject to forfeiture. Moreover, where the defendant sets aside racketeering money subject to forfeiture to pay his attorney's fees, that money could still be seized. In response to the argument that this violated the right to counsel, the Supreme Court observed that the right to counsel guaranteed criminal defendants only the rights to be represented by an attorney the defendant could afford. Forfeited property did not belong to the defendant, and he thus had no right to dispose of it. Other Racketeering Statutes Since the enactment of federal RICO in 1970s, most states have enacted their own anti-racketeering statutes, sometimes known as baby RICO statutes. Despite the underwhelming nickname, these statutes are often more comprehensive and encompassing than their federal counterpart. The Supreme Court of Georgia, for example, observed that Georgia's racketeering statute is so broad as to be amorphous and that it has been compared to an obscure iceberg, the dim outline of its base extending seemingly forever under the waters of Georgia criminal jurisprudence. An American Bar Association 2017 paper lists several reasons that state RICO statutes are important, even in light of the existence of the broad federal RICO statute, including 1. Many state RICO statutes have significantly broader civil and criminal applications than the federal statute, incorporating an array of state law offenses that are outside the scope of the federal statute. 2. Many state RICO statutes have longer periods of limitations than the federal statute. 3. Many state RICO statutes have fewer essential elements than the federal statute. 4. Many state RICO statutes allow the recovery of a broader range of damages in civil actions. 5. Many state RICO statutes specifically authorize equitable relief for private parties that might not be available under the federal statute. 6. While federal criminal RICO prosecutions must receive prior approval from the Organized Crime and Racketeering Section of the Department of Justice, in most states, RICO prosecutions can be initiated without centralized review. And 7. Restrictive changes to the federal RICO statute, such as the elimination of securities fraud as a predicate act, do not affect state RICO statutes. Finally, 
A federal compliment to RICO, the Violent Crimes in Aid of Racketeering, or VCAR, statute, makes it a federal crime to commit a variety of violent acts in support of an enterprise that engages in racketeering. This statute has the potential to greatly increase the scope of federal criminal law. While acts such as robbery, assault, kidnapping, etc. would not normally be federal crimes, if they are done to aid a criminal enterprise, they can be prosecuted on the federal level. For example, in United States v. Perez, the defendant was charged with having participated in activities of the Latin Kings, an alleged racketeering enterprise. The indictment charged Perez with a series of criminal acts, such as murder, attempted murder, and gun possession in connection with that gang. Perez argued that Vicar was unconstitutional as applied, because it criminalized specific acts that are state crimes and that bear no relationship to interstate commerce. The court rejected the argument, saying that Vicar prohibits racketeering, which, when looked at in the aggregate, substantially affects interstate commerce. Thank you for participating in Shell's video course on white-collar crime. We hope that this could interfere with law enforcement and the justice system, and constitute patterns of unlawful behavior. We hope that you will continue your study of criminal laws that corporate officials must be wary of in courses such as securities regulation. Best of luck, and please let us know if you have any questions or feedback. I can fantasize about Chelsea and, and use masturbation as a gift to keep myself focused. In a healthy marriage, how often should a couple have sex? Let's go! <laughs> God just keeps helping me. And I grew up thinking that he did that because... I didn't have sex until I got married. Now I'm married. Y'all got no idea what guilt-free sex is like. It's amazing. Only a nine-minute drive from where luxurious department stores like Versace, Balenciaga, and Tiffany's live on road.